So welcome everyone to the, the first workshop of the day. Uh, we have Aflac with, um, oh, this is the wrong slide, test automation with the robot framework. So I'll pass you over there and enjoy. Thank you. All right, thanks for that. Um, okay, so let's share my camera. Right, everyone. So, um, yep, my name is Monet um, from Aflac and I. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the company right now, but if you want to, the event booth will be open after this talk. Um, so, go across, head over. There will be certain graduates and placement positions opening up towards the middle of the year. So, go find out more from the guys about all of that later on. Right, so let me share my screen. So, um, yep, so today we'll be looking at test automation and I'll be using robot framework for that and I'll explain more of, about the reasoning behind that as well. So before we really get into the, the code side of things, I thought I just wanted to cover some of the logic behind automated testing and some theory that we would just want to speak about before we get into the nitty gritty of things. So uh, test automation has been around probably about two decades, maybe a little bit longer. Um, now, what's important whenever you do try apply a strategy is that you think about the type of testing that you want to do and the level that you're going to do it on. All right. So the main heuristic that we'll use to help us with that is what we call the test automation pyramid. All right. So now um, you can see we've got several different examples of ones here. Uh, generally, what we want to get out of these is where we're talking about the number of tests we want to do and the reasoning behind that. So you can see at the base of all the pyramids are the unit tests, all right? So these will be small pieces of code that's being tested with very simple tests. So these will be um, very basically inside small functions, um, just testing data ranges and things like that. So as you can see, the pyramids will show you that the closer we get to the code, the more solid the tests are, the more stable they run. And that's because you don't really have to have a system up and running. You can just have your code on your laptop or your computer. You can create unit tests and you can run. There's no interacting with anything else. Once you built up that confidence, we then elevate our code to a higher environment. We might be interacting now across a network, speaking to a database, interacting with other services and the rest. So we're going to test little workflows between those things to make sure that those combinations of things are working. Then the next step we're going to get up to is testing from the UI level, right? So now these tests are going to be the most difficult to run because it requires a fully functioning system basically um, in order to get there. So we don't use this for testing simple functionality. We use that when we're confident that everything we've built to this point is correct. All right, so a nice way to think of this is if we're testing uh, the lock for a car, we don't want to build the entire car just to make sure that the lock mechanism works, all right? We test the lock mechanism on its own then we're confident that that works. We know we can use that locking key anywhere and it's going to work. All right. So quite a few different reasons why we'd use it, but I just wanted to make sure that um, cover that in the background. So the testing we're going to look at today will be on the top of the pyramid here, the actual automated GUI tests. And that's just because it's the most tangible one. It's the ones that's nice to see and you can watch, watch the web browser work in a way like mad in the background. Um, also an important caveat to the test pyramid is that not every system is going to be built in such a way where we're going to be able to do all of the testing on the unit, -based level, unit test level and then narrow it down as we go up, all right? So some systems, it's going to have pretty small bits of functionality built in. There's going to be lots of data variations, all right? So we can see something here where most of the testing is going to be done on the API level because that's going to be doing data mapping and making decisions based on different things. You know, so it might make more sense to do that on that level, right? In some situations, some of the products we even have at Aflac, we have to do the bulk of our testing from the UI just because of the nature of the, the software we're using. We have to, uh, we can't really do much of the testing down on those lower levels. Okay. Um, also worth noting, there are an absolute crazy abundance of tools out there on the market. So we have the most common ones would be Selenium for your normal web-based testing. We have Appium that would be um, the same guys that made Selenium made Appium. That's going to be used for testing uh, native mobile applications on phones and tablets and all the rest. 
We have um, up and comers like Cypress and Playwright run a bit differently to Selenium. All of them have their pros and cons and different reasons to use them. Of course, there's a whole lot that I've got on the screen. There's a whole bunch more that you could look at as well. So, you know, it's not gonna be one size fits all. Um, <clears throat> today, what we're gonna be looking at is we'll be using Robot Framework, which will be our main uh, interface to the test. And we'll be using Selenium under the hood. All right, Selenium, it's been around for a long time. Um, it's quite reliable, has its faults, as such as everything else would, but uh, it's pretty good. Selenium 4 is coming out. Um, well, they've been saying it's going to come out next month for about two years now, but you know, I'm pretty sure they mean it this time. But uh, anyway, so we'll be using Selenium 3 for today. Um, and then Robot Framework, what's nice about it is it is a interface language, basically simple English, all right? And what we're doing is lower down is we're referencing Python libraries. Okay, so we can create a full test suite. We can work for years creating test suites, testing APIs, testing mobile apps, testing web pages and everything else without ever having to look at Python. Or if you're more technical, what you could do is move some of the functionality down into Python. If you are so inclined and you want to kind of keep your hands dirty with learning Python and working with that, you could move more of those steps down into that level and then you can just reference them from the um, higher interface level that is robot framework. Right. Um, you might see in some companies, they wouldn't use something like robot, they would create their own framework. Um, so that's quite handy because you have more control over what the framework itself is doing and how it interacts with things. The downside is that now you have to maintain two sets of code, right? You have to maintain the actual framework that's going through running your tests and you have to maintain your test code. All right, so you've got to kind of think now if, if a test breaks, is it because my framework is broken or is it because my test is broken or because the system was broken? All right, so we use robot framework. Someone else is worrying about that. We're just getting um, the best results at the end of the day out of it. Okay, um, I have quite a few slides where I talk through the benefits of test automation. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these because it'll take quite a while. I'm just going to kind of click through them slowly as I talk about it. I've also got some notes on automation best practices. Um, just going to go through these. So um, anyone that doesn't get the um, PowerPoint stack after this can just watch the video back and can just kind of pause and read each of one of these in greater detail. All right, um, we're almost there. Okay, and I've got some useful links at the end. We'll come back to these later on. Okay, so let's uh, look at what we're going to be testing today. So there is a test website that is called uh, Swag Labs. Uh, just a very basic e-commerce site. You can see here, there's different user types we can use. And then there is a standard password for all of them. So basically you would just do your normal login. You would come into what looks like a little page. You select a couple items, you get your cart. You can check out, uh, remove items back shopping. Go to the checkout, into your details and continue. You get here, then we'll look and we have items and tax and total and everything else. And then we finish. And then this would be the transaction complete page. All right, so essentially we're going to automate some of that today. Um, so we'll start off with a the most common step, first step, which will be the uh, happy path successful login. All right, so let's go and have a look at some robot code. So you'll see here we have a file. I'm using uh, Visual Studio Code. Oh, yep, yeah, that's it, Visual Studio Code. And I'm using a plugin called, let me get it up here so you know what to look up. It is Robot Framework IntelliSense. All right, um, if you want to get the one that has the good IntelliSense, I recommend using this fork in this version. It works a bit better than the, the, the main branch for it. So uh, look that up and get that installed. Um, I should also mention, I do have a GitHub repo that I've created. Everything that you're going to see today and a whole lot more is inside that. Installation instructions for robots all there. Um, so after the course, you can feel free, um, download it all, have a look, play around, install robots, um, go crazy. I would have liked to do a bit more of a hands-on session, but I think time's going to kind of prevent us getting all of that. The setup would probably take 20, 30 minutes to get everyone ready on that level. All right, so we have a file. You see there it's called swagexample.robot. That's the standard extension we're going to use for our test suites. And um, 
each file that has a bunch of test cases in it is going to be referenced as a test suite. Okay, so you can see here the syntax. Um, we can split it up into sections, which will be a settings, variables, and test cases. All right, so settings, we will use this to import whatever resources we're going to use. All right, so like I said, we're using the Selenium library. We can also if we're going to do API testing, we would import whatever requests library we're going to be using or you know, whatever abundance of uh, tools are available for us. We can also put code into different files and we can then import those as a resource. Um, we'll, look, we'll see that a bit later. And then we can also do some things here like suite setup and teardown and test setup and teardown. And I'll talk a bit about more, more about that later on as well. So uh, variable section, Quite obviously, we're just going to list all of our variables out there we want to use. You can see here I've created one for the, um, the URL and the browser we're going to use. Test cases section, again, each of the test cases we're going to have. And then there's another section we can add, which I'll talk about later on. So at this point, I also want to mention, you can see here, I have like these, these big gaps between different things, right? Now that's because the way robot works, it has this English, English language interface. Now to do that, we need spaces, right? So robot essentially ignores white space or a single space character. It's actually another things with it in the background. Um, but the important thing for us to know right now is that a single space will ultimately be ignored by robots. Okay, so I could name our variables with a space in it like that if I wanted to, or I could just leave it as a single word. I'll just leave it as single words because it's easier to double click if I want to copy paste. Um, and then we need two or more spaces to delineate between statements or variables, whatever the case might be. Um, the standard is to use four just because it gives you a nice clear visual delineation of where there's a single space or multiple spaces. Right? Then I think a standard tab is going to be four spaces as well. So that's probably part of the reason. All right. Um, again, white space being important, similar to some other code things, um, we will want to indent. So a test case name will touch the left margin, and then all the steps relevant to that test case will be indented two spaces or more away from the margin. All right, so we're ready to get started. Um, the first thing we're going to want to do when we run our test is we're going to want to open the, uh, the web page itself. All right, so how do we know how we tell Selenium to do that? Now, the way we're going to do that is using this Selenium library documentation. All right, so each robot framework library is going to have this same format documentation. It's going to have a list of all of the available keywords down the side. It's going to probably have some nice introduction text at the beginning explaining how to use things, how to locate elements. We'll be looking at that very soon and all the different things you can do with the library. All right, and it's got a nice little search bar here as well. So the first thing we're going to want to do is open the browser. So we just type in, you see it gives us the shortcut, we click on the link, and it takes us to that section of this document that has the information on how we open the browser. So that's the keyword name. This is the string we're going to use in our test. And then there's a series of arguments that we can use, obviously, to kind of make the test more dynamic. Uh, so we can see the first one is the URL, and the second one is browser, then alias, and a whole bunch that we don't need to worry about right now. And you can see they all have default values as well. So if I just said open browser, it would open a blank Firefox browser at no location, right? That's not what we want, but um, it is nice to know that you have those default values uh, if you wanted. If you look in the documentation, if you see arguments that don't have an equals to or a default character, then they're mandatory and they're sequenced, then you have to give you have to give those variables or those arguments in that order. But we'll see that very soon as well. All right, so it's open browser, then I'll pass in the URL and the browser type we're going to use. So let's get cracking. Uh, open browser. Right now, be forewarned, there will be many typos, but uh, that's part of the fun of a live demo. All right, so you can see there I'm calling open browser and I'm just passing in the variables that I've created up at the top there. Uh, the next thing I'm going to want to do is input the name, the username. So I'll come back here. All right, how am I going to do that? First typo. Uh, all right, and you'll see there we can input text. 
So we click on that, gives us a link. We see the arguments it needs. All right, so now we need, um, so these are mandatory, so we have to do them and we have to do them in the correct order. And you'll see here, it's the locator and the text. All right, so um, the locator, you may or may not know this. Um, this is a, each HTML element on the page has a way that, that we can look it up. All right, so we can use the dev tools in the browser. Uh, to access that, we can either use F12, it'll bring it up. We can access it through our menu here. If we go more tools, developer tools, you see there's another keyboard shortcut, or probably the most logical one is if you just go right click and inspect. All right, then what it'll do is take you directly to that element in your DOM. And then obviously if you scroll through this, you can see Chrome will highlight which element your mouse is hovering over inside that DOM. Okay, so you can see here, uh, the standard structure of this element is going to have the HTML tag, which for us is an input. It's going to have a series of key value pair attributes. And um, tell you what, the one that we're going to be most interested in is the ID, all right? So um, IDs are not guaranteed uniqueness on a web page, right? HTML is very forgiving that way, it's, but it is going to be one that's most likely to be unique, all right? Hopefully whenever people are, developers are creating web pages, they will have given all the elements IDs and will have been a bit conscious about giving it a, um, a nice unique name. If not, there's other tools we can use, but um, ideally we're going to use an ID. Um, then number two on the hierarchy would be name. Then we would go down to class. But now the lower down we go this list, the less likely it is for, for the, uh, the attribute to be unique. Um, so I just wanted to also mention if we have a look inside our documentation here, you can see there's a nice clear section on how to locate elements. Um, and then you can see it mentions there what the different strategies are we can use. And then it gives us some nice examples of how we can use them. And I think that is in the actual keyword. No, we'll enter it. We don't need examples. You're gonna see one right now. So enter it. Okay, so I said we're gonna use ID. All right, so I'm just gonna copy that out. Let's go over to our test and we're going to input. It's always going to be input that gets me wrong. <laughs> Impute, input text. And we're using ID as our locator and we paste it in. And then we're going to put in the text was the next argument, which we know is standard user. Okay, so that's pretty cool. So that's the next thing. Next is password. We know that that's the next one in our DOM. We have an ID for that. So we have very friendly developers for this website who make sure they put in nice clear tags for us. And password, and it was super secret, but not a secret source. Okay, now the next thing we're gonna do is click the login button. So we know that that's next on our list. So that's gonna be something different. So let's see what we have here. So we're gonna click. And so we have options, we've got a click button, we've got a click element, image, link, all these different ones. Um, so there is a click button, but what I can fast forward through trying it to finding an error is that this won't work. And now the reason for that is this element type isn't actually a button, all right? So we'll talk a little bit later on about what robots doing in the background when we're calling things by ID and that, and we'll talk about XPaths, but um, for now, what I can tell you is that click button won't work. So we're gonna rely on the next one, which is a bit of a, a generic approach, which is click element, all right? So in this case, it doesn't matter what the element type is that we're referencing. If it's a label or a button or a, anything, doesn't matter what it is, it's gonna find that element and it's gonna click on it. So we'll use this one instead. So let's get back. So I'm gonna go click element. I'm gonna pass in the ID, which I didn't copy. And that's it. Okay, um, now any good test is gonna be structured in the same way, right? So we're gonna use the design pattern for that, which a couple different names you can have it, but the one I'm gonna to mention today is what we call the triple A, all right? So it's arrange, act, and assert. So arranging is getting ourselves into the state we want to be in. Acting is performing the action we want, and then asserting is making sure that the test is done has given us or the web page that we're testing has performed the result that we were expecting. All right, so for now, we only really have two parts of that. 
you can see we have the arrange, which you could either classify that as the arranging, and then this is the test part, and then we need to do the assertion. Okay, so let's see. So if we were to log in, we would want to make sure we're on the new page. And in order to do that, you can maybe say like the location should be this, or we could maybe find a unique element on the page, and we want to make sure that that's loaded up. All right, so what I can tell you in advance is that this little um, drop down box in the top right is a unique element. Okay, so we have a look. So that's got a class. Uh, so that'll do. That is still unique. So we can copy that and we'll come across to our test. And we're going to use a keyword that is called wait until element exists. Oh no, we would actually rather use is visible. And we're using a class this time instead of an ID and we put the value in there. <clears throat> All right. Now the reason we're using this wait until element is visible. There is also one that's called element is visible. The problem is that sometimes web pages might take a while to load. All right. So Selenium's going through as quickly as it can. It's performing a step and then it's performing the next step. It's not waiting for feedback. So what could happen is that we click on the element that logs in, and then straight away, if we're saying, I want to see if this element's visible, it's very possible that it hasn't loaded in that short period of time. So the ways that you might work around it is by putting in an explicit sleep or something, say, let's sleep for two seconds. There's a couple of problems with that, right? Number one is the sleep might not be long enough for every situation, in which case the test is going to fail. Alternatively, the test could be ready within two milliseconds, but we're going to sit waiting for two seconds each time you run the test, waiting for this box to come up. So, you know, then we do, our test runs are just going to be slower. So we avoid the explicit weights wherever we can, and then the wait until is an implicit wait. All right, so this is going to have a timeout, which we can configure. I think the default's five seconds, but you can easily just configure that from here if you wanted. You could just do timeout equals 20 seconds, and then we would wait for 20 seconds. And what it will do is just constantly poll the page, waiting for that element to appear. And the second it comes in, it's going to go and it's going to execute that step and then move on to the next one. All right, so that's how we can build in some testability. All right, so we'll put that in and then uh, tell you what, let's capture the pay, capture a screenshot as well. I'm just going to delete this just for good measure. And then we're conscientious testers. And so we're going to close the browser or close the board door behind us when we leave. All right, so believe it or not, we now have a fully functioning web test. Uh, so I'm going to execute this command, which you can see is um, we're calling the robot executable. I'm just saying, uh, put all of the output into this directory, which it will create. And then uh, this is the file, our test suite that we want to execute. And I need to catch this, it opens up on my other screen. So let's run that. Browser open, enter the details and it's signed in and you can see there a test successfully passed. So let's have a quick look. Uh, and we are in here. See there, it created that folder. We've got our report. Let's open that up. And you'll see here it's green background because we passed. What will become your favorite shade of green? No doubt. Uh, here's a list if we had multiple test suites, so it'll all be listed here. We just had the one, click in. There's all the test cases. We just had one. We'll see what it looks like when there's multiples. Uh, you can see there it took nine seconds to run and was pass. And if we click into this, you'll see then we have all of the steps that we performed. And then we can drill down into each one of these and it gives us more details. Then you can see that we captured a screenshot, which will all then embed in the report as well. All right, so that's, uh, that's pretty cool. It didn't take us that long to create that fully functioning test. So functionality is one thing, but uh, kind of looking good, reuse of code, maintainability, all of those things, that's another. All right, so we look at this, doesn't look very nice, right? It's not a lot of reuse. Um, everything's just kind of very static. So let's create some more variables, All right? So I'm going to move this locator up here and we'll call this uh, username edit box. And We'll go here, and in the interest of saving time, I won't make you watch me fumble my way through doing that for everything. 
we'll just uh, copy paste. All right, so you can see now, we just fast forwarded a couple minutes. But you can see I have input text and I'm going to input text into the username edit box and I'm going to use the correct username. All right, so at least now the, the steps have more context to what I'm doing. But it's still not great, all right? So we're still we're talking about input text and click elements and weights. You know, if someone, if we had to give this to a business person and say, is this test performing what you expected? They're not, they're not going to get a full idea. You know, and you can imagine if this is quite a big test case with lots of steps and moving between screens, it's not going to be very clear what we're doing, all right? So we're going to create our own bespoke keywords for this. So to do that, we create the fourth and final section, which is keywords. All right, so keywords are just methods that we're creating. And uh, we will replace this text. And we'll say, we're going to navigate to Swag Labs. And I'll show you all the wrong things to do up front so that you don't do them yourself. All right, so there we go. So keyword, same as a test case. The name touches the left margin, and then we indent for everything underneath that. All right, so now we're going to do the same for all of these steps. So let's see, we'll take this out. This will be, we'll populate username. And that's going to be input text username. Okay, but we can't really do that because uh, now we're going to hard code the correct username into this. So just as we would do with regular programming, um, we're going to make this more generic. Okay, so let's see. So we're going to rather pass it in as an argument from our test case, so we can use it in argument. Let's do this. Um, so we're going to pass in arguments. We'll give it a obvious name, which will just be username, nice and generic. And that's what we're going to then pass into the step, rather than the hard coded one. And then our test step will now just be populate username and then the type of username that we want to pass in, which you know is going to be the standard user. All right. So we're going to just keep on doing the same for everything else. And again, I'll just fast forward. And... Okay. So now we have all of our keywords built out. They're nice and generic where they need to be. And now we look at our test case, we can see it's nice and clean. We're going to navigate to Swag Labs, populate the username with the correct username, click the login button, verify we're on the inventory page. It's nice and clean, very easy to understand. And again, if we run this now, um, you'll see, drag that across. See the test still executes and it still passes. It's exactly the same that we saw before. Um, and now when we look at our report, we'll go straight to the log file for this one. You can see now it's nice and clean what we were doing. All right, so th now the test is essentially self-documenting. We don't have to give descriptions of what we're trying to do and what steps we're following. The test has actually documented itself because it's nice and clean. All right, so that was pretty handy. Um, now what we want to do is, um, we're going to create some more tests, but instead of doing a happy path, we're going to do all the negative path testing, all right? So what if the username is wrong or empty or password's wrong or whatever kind of scenarios like that we're going to test. So I don't want to do that in this test suite. I want to use this only for my positive test flows. And I'm going to create a new test suite for all of my different negative test flows. The problem we have at the moment is that these keywords only have the scope of this test file. All right, then these variables, the same thing. But all of my negative tests are going to want to use the same steps. So now we're going to use another design pattern in automated testing, which is called a page object or a page object model. Okay, so already got one created here. So now we'll see the context of how these will be used are completely, um, uh, what's the word, agnostic. The tests don't care. This doesn't care how it's been used. It's just available for use. So all of them, there's, there's no test cases in here. And it's just a resource file. And you can see there I've called it a, a dot resource. Um, so now any test suite can reference this file and then have full access to all of the variables and the keywords inside of it. All right, so we've reduced that duplication across multiple test suites. So um, we'll fast forward a little bit again. And now I'm on a, a 
actually wait, before I do this, let's talk a little bit more about web element locators. All right, and we'll look specifically at XPaths this time. Okay, so if there's anything wrong with the login, we click the login button, you see we get this error message. So let's inspect that. And we'll see here, there's no, there's no ID or name or class or any kind of, there's none of these basic um, element locators in this list that we see here. All right, so we're gonna actually then have to create our own XPath to locate that element. So let's go back. So XPaths, they can be a little bit scary at first when you understand them, they're actually quite simple and they're the most powerful web locator tool out there. All right, you can use XPaths in quite a few different ways. And um, I'll send out a link to a really good instructional video on how to use them in every situation. All right, so you can, you can find absolutely any element on the web page using XPaths. Now they're all gonna follow the same basic structure whenever we create them, all right? So if, you, if you're in this little window and you press Control F, you'll see we brought up a little viewer down at the bottom, all right? So let's have a look at what an XPath would look like for our, um, for our username option, okay? So we start off with a double forward slash, and that's gonna basically say any um, item that matches this criteria, starting from the top of the page going down. A single slash would be start at the top and work down. Um, a double means anywhere that's that's in the DOM, all right? So the first item we're going to put in is the HTML tag, which we know is this one here, which is input, all right? So we're going to say, show me all of your input HTML tags. And we'll see here, we have three, all right? So if we click through this, we'll see the three different input tags that we have, all right? So we don't want three, we want one. So we're going to now add some more criteria to this. So we put in our square brackets, and remember these are attributes, attributes of the element. So we'll say at attribute of ID must equal, now this is a, an exact uh, string match, so this will be case sensitive, and username. And now you can see there, now that's taken us directly to only one of one. Okay, so this is a pretty good X pass. Now you remember I said earlier that the click button option wouldn't work in robot because this wasn't a button. Now that's because what robot's doing in the background is it's building out an X pass. And what it would have done if I said click button is it would have gone and created an X pass that's, that's looking for an, a button element type. But like we saw, this is actually an input and that's why it wouldn't work. And that's why we decided to use the click element rather. Right, so um, that's a pretty basic X pass. That's a standard structure. Like I say, watch that video that I'll send in the link. Pretty amazing stuff, how you can locate the, the web pages from that. Okay. So back to the demo. Uh, okay, so that's our page object, all the functionality is there. And I have prepared a, oh yeah, so what I do want to mention is that's where I've added that additional, that X path to locate. It will tell us when that error message has come up. And we added the keyword, which is verify error messages displayed, right? So that's how we're going to do that third step of the AAA thing, which is asserting the result of the test is doing what we expected it to do. All right, so here is a working test suite. We have three test cases in it. You see it's wrong username, wrong password, and wrong username and password. So I'm sure we can all agree it looks nice and tidy, but this is this is a lot of repetition. All right, we're programmers. Um, we know that uh, there's the dry principle, which is don't repeat yourself, and we have definitely repeated ourselves here. All right, so this isn't this isn't actually very clean code. It's not nice to maintain as well, because you change something in the login step, we're gonna have to go and change all of these. If I want to add a new one, ugh, copy paste all this code, make the changes, it's quite a lot I need to do. All right, so we're gonna use, we're gonna create a new bespoke keyword for ourselves again. All right, so to do that, we're going to, actually, I'll tell you what we'll do. We're gonna use a test template, all right? So we're gonna create a data-driven test, which is a different style of testing. This would be a con considered a keyword-driven test, what we're going to do is a, what is called a data driven. All right, so we declare a test template, which tells us every time you see a test case that touches this left hand margin, it's going to go and run this test case or this keyword. So let's copy that name down there. So that's what it'll be called, a nice generic name. Then uh, let's just copy this down and make this generic as well. Okay, so we're going to have all the same steps for everything. And then we know we're passing it to arguments. So to make it nice and reusable, 
say arguments. Oops. Uh, just be username. And password will replace these. And so now the test case itself doesn't have to have anything underneath it. We just say what the arguments are that we want to pass in. We can put that next to it. Just keep it nice and clean on, on the single line. All right. Um, so we can do the same for everything else. But as with the everything else, we will fast forward and uh, all right, so nope. so fast forward. So we have our, our keywords there. You see I've added quite a few more now. So we've got a couple options of what if it's an empty username or empty password, empty both, incorrect, correct combinations. We've got all these different combinations. So now you can see each one of these lines is its own test case. So it's much cleaner. So now we've gone down from having 50 lines for three tests to having 30 lines for, what's it, six, seven tests. Right, and it's a nice reusable thing. What I've also done is use some more of the functionality, which is the uh, suite setup and teardown. All right, so now what these will do is it'll run this keyword once at the beginning of this entire test suite, and then it'll close the browser right at the end. All right, so the reason I've done that is so that we won't open and close the browser for each test case. We'll just open it up front in the beginning, run our test on the page, and then we'll close it down when we're done. All right, so uh, let's have a look at what that looks like. Um, I'll run it from here. Okay, all of them always save. And, all right, there we go. And now we'll see, we're trying all these different combinations. We're verifying the error message, all this test case passed. And if we come back and have a look at our output, we'll see if we click into that, you'll see now we have the multiple test cases inside that test suite. And of course, again, we can click down and, and have a closer look inside of that. All right. Um, so uh, it's looking pretty good. Um, so that's, before I kind of look at anything else, are there any questions that anyone has on any of that? I know that we went through, trust me, we went through a lot of principles and quite a bit of code there, um, lightning pace. And I know I don't speak the slowest at times as well. So uh, do we have any questions? You can either write them in the chat or... Uh... All right, there you are. Okay, there's uh, Marcel commenting on XPaths. Yep, that's right. Yeah, so we had that XPath. Um, I'll share the link for that later. All right, so what we also want to look at, remember I did say we can do um, our API testing from here as well. So here's just a little example. Um, not gonna lie, I just copied this one off the internet. Um, <clears throat> but basically you'll see we're using some different libraries. So we have um, the collections library. So this we're gonna use for data dictionaries and lists. We can control all of that from there, adding and deleting and comparing lists and dictionaries. And we're using the requests library which is a HTTP request library. Okay, so that's gonna be used for all of our API calls, all of our gets and posts, so then verifying responses and things like that. So here you can see the test setup. We're just gonna create a session, which we give an alias, and then that's gonna then create a session with the um, with that URL endpoint. And then uh, we're also gonna create a new session with Google. We're then gonna perform a get on the Google session going to verify that we get a 200 in return. Um, we're then going to do a get on the JSON placeholder for the post. I think that's going to just send back a template maybe of what we're going to do for the post. We're then it's going to verify that we get a, got an okay response from Google as well. But then we're going to check that our response from Google has this string in the body. Very nice rolls off the tongue string in the body there. We're then going to do another test, which is going to be posting a request which is then going to, but part of our setup is we're going to create a dictionary with these different key value pair items in it. We're then going to post it to the JSON placeholder session. And then we're going to check that we get a 201, which is a created status. 
then we're just going to verify that the body contains that. Okay, so let's uh, let's give that a run. Um, so robot, and I'll just keep it simple. Cool. So that ran nice and quick. You'll see we plug some of the things out to the console. But let's have a look at the report. And we'll click into that. And then you can see um, whenever we did the get, that's what the response looked like. And it, you know, that's the, the title. So there's that's what we did the comparison on whenever we got the response back. Uh, you can see we got a 200 with an okay reason. And then the same for the post. We got a 201. And uh, let's see. That's what we got back. And then there was the ID was, there we go. So that's the ID that was assigned by the system. So we were just verifying that that attribute was present in the response that we got back. Cool. So um, let's talk a little bit about what's available for you online. Um, I wasn't looking myself up, sorry. I just put this in here. <laughs> uh, so Put it into the chat as well. Um, connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I run each quarter, I run a out of hours workshop on automating with robot framework. Um, it's about 10 hours in total, probably going to be uh, one night a week, or maybe we can shorten it down to a couple weekend sessions, depending on what the average group is. Um, but we go through, it's a much more expanded version of what we looked at today. We're going to create detail about how to automate things and everything else. So if you're interested in signing up for that, connect with me, send me a message saying, hey, I'd like to hear more about this, and then uh, I can add you into the mix for that. Also follow Aflac and I. Um, like I said earlier, the guys in the in the expo booth will talk more about that, um, but we'll leave that for there. You can also see I'd mentioned testing on a mobile device. So let me zoom on this. So this is just a test, a little demo video I'd done. You can see I'm using a emulator here. So the only difference with these tests was that instead of using the Selenium library, I used the Appium library. You can see there the tests all look pretty much the same. We've got our data we're passing in. And then when that executes, that's now, you know, if, if we were running it on, if we had a physical device plugged into the laptop and that's what our Appium test was connected to, then it would be running on your actual physical mobile device but we were just using the emulator because it's a bit easier to set up. All right, I won't make you watch that whole video. I think, <laughs> get get the general idea. See, there's the Appium libraries being used. And, all right, so what's available online? Um, let me put this into the chat as well. So this is just a little repo that I created. Um, it has installation instructions. So you just install Python 3, add a couple environment variables um, to the scripts folder. I think the Python install will do this one automatically for you. You need to add a separate one for the scripts folder. We need some web drivers. So these are the components. So this is what Selenium's talking to. And then these drivers are then talking to the, the actual um, web browsers, all right? So, You'll need one for Chrome and Firefox and Edge and IE, whatever you want to run your tests on, they'll each have their own uh, web driver. So you can download those, gave you the path to get the, the Chrome one, which is what we use today. Um, excuse me. If you want to run separately, actually that's what I can show you quick, we got a bit of time. Um, if I wanted to run this example in Firefox, which is hopefully installed for the purposes of this demo, I just have to change this here and uh, just waiting for it to fire up. Nope, really should have tested that before the time. I think I don't know if Firefox installed or there's something funny with it, but essentially that's all you'd need to do is just change the browser type that you're doing in. You can also override any of these variables from the command line. So instead of changing my test code, I could just from outside, I could say, 
override the variable for browser to be Firefox instead of Chrome for this test run. So it's nice and dynamic that way. Now, but in rate, so back to um, what you can look at on GitHub is you can then uh, get your web drivers. You just use the pip install, get robot framework, the Selenium library and the debug library. And then uh, if you pull down this code, you can then just uh, execute it and it should all run for you locally then. And then there's some really good links here. Um, there's a big series of um, links here. So this is a nice curated list, which has pretty much every useful library for Robot Framework that's available. So instead of trying to search Chrome, go through Google or Pipey or all these different things to try to find it, you can just come in here and uh, there's nice descriptions and links to pretty much anything that you'd want to do your test against. Soap testing, um, what else have we got? Selenium uh, or the eyes library, that's for doing visual verification using Apply tools. Uh, there's a whole bunch of libraries in there, links and all the rest. We also have, um, there's a cookbook, which gives nice snippets of example code for different things. So how to do, um, how to handle lists, do for loops, logging, XML, all of these different things that uh, you're probably going to want to at some point do some level of testing on. There's some nice sample code there. Okay. So uh, is there anything else you'd like to see me try do? Probably fail <laughs> something I haven't practiced or are there any questions anyone has on any of that? I don't know if anyone's typing or not. Um, cool, well, thanks Ashin, yep. So like I say, so go have a look at that, uh, that little repo of mine. Uh, very simple to run. Uh, there's a lot of documentation for robot framework as well. Have a look here. <clears throat> so this is the documentation they provide full user guide, examples of everything you need, and then these are all the built-in libraries that come with it. So if you're interacting with date time or the operating system, um, general string functionality, all of the work's really done for it. Now that's a nice thing about Python in general, and then also with Robot Framework because it's utilizing all that Python is, if you want to do something, there's a pretty good chance someone's already done it. You know, So you can just kind of consume someone else's knowledge um, or someone else's hard work. <laughs> um, I think you can watch the video, Andrew. <laughs> no worries. Um, cool. I think we'll leave it there. I know there's another uh, sidetrack conversation starting now. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, connect on LinkedIn, and then I think we can call it a day. Perfect. Thank you. Actually. That was really interesting. And yeah, it's a very cool technology. So thank you very much. Um, so this session will be back again at one, where we'll have Microsoft going through um, inclusive uh, in the workspace. So thank you. Thanks, bye everyone.